Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the workshop. It's Tim for Tim Cross Electronics, and this is part two of our $75 Dumbbell Build series. I've started out with an old uh, PV Valve King that I, I have used for a couple previous projects, and uh, the most recent one didn't work out so well, and I kind of lost interest in it, so it's just been sitting around forever waiting for me to figure out what to do with it. Well, I'm using all of those parts, the uh, the chassis, the cabinet, the speaker, and whatever other parts I can take out of it from a previous build. And uh, my intention is to build a complete Dumble Overdrive Special style amplifier with a couple tweaks here and there for under $75. Still not sure whether I'm going to be able to make that $75 mark. I think it's going to be pretty close. Anyway, today I am ready to start assembling the main circuit board. Now normally uh, what I like to use are eyelet boards or tag boards. I've worked with turret boards in the past and, and turret boards just, um, it's too time consuming to me. I, I don't really care for them a whole lot. One of the things that I do really like about both tag boards and eyelet boards is the fact that uh, you can, you can that the holes are usually big enough that you can solder several components into the same hole and still have uh, room for a wire to deliver a uh, voltage or whatever you need to do with, with that. A drawback of both tag boards and eyelet boards is first of all the expense. They're not super cheap. You normally you know, for one that's about that long, you're going to spend eight or nine bucks normally, which is, you know, it's not a huge expense, but it could be cheaper. And then the other problem with them, especially with eyelet boards, is just the time and expense of actually installing all the eyelets and staking them in place. Um, the eyelets themselves aren't really expensive, but there is quite a bit of time uh, involved in staking all of them. Now, one of the things that I like about tag boards, that I like better about tag boards than eyelet boards, is that these tags have three different points that you can solder components to. They've got the eyelet in the center, and then on each end, they've got a hole on, on, uh, on the tag. Uh, the problem with tag boards is that these tags are sometimes really difficult to pry up so that you can solder to them. So, I've come up with a solution. I designed these boards and had them made. I ordered, ordered several of them. And uh, if these work out as well as I think they're going to, then I'm going to have these available for sale on my website, timkelectronics.com. Basically, what I've done with this design is I've taken the best parts of tag boards and eyelet boards and incorporated them into a printed circuit board. So these holes are all through plated, they're all oversized, you're going to have just as much room in these holes as you would in an eyelet, but you don't have the time and expense of actually staking all of these eyelets. I think these are going to work out really nicely, I'll know for sure after I assemble this amplifier. I'll show you what I've done inside the chassis, I've already got one of these mounted on some standoffs, so let's take a look at that. So I've gone ahead and installed the standoffs and mounted the circuit boards in here just to uh, kind of test fit everything and make sure uh, I like the way it's sitting. Uh, but this is, gonna, this is what we're going to be working with. Now here's a closer shot of these boards and uh, you should be able to see these three holes are connected so it's basically giving you the same uh, advantages that you would get with a uh, tag board uh, but a lot easier to work with. And then you've got additional uh, solder points in the center there. These two are not connected. And then right next to it you can see a little ground pad there. And then there and there as well. Both ends of the board have those three ground pads. You only use one though. And basically what that's doing is that's capturing any emissions coming off of the high voltage wires in here and uh, kind of sucking them up and, uh, and dumping them off to ground. That should help us prevent some uh, additional interference. Um, not that I think there would be a problem with this particular layout. I, I think uh, I've done a good enough job of uh, avoiding any issues with that. But it is a nice feature to have, and that's something you're not going to get from an eyelet board. Okay, so this is the schematic that we're working from. And uh, I'll put a bigger one up on the screen so you can take a look at it. If you're familiar with the Dumble Overdrive Special Circuit, then uh, you'll see there's uh, it's it's basically an ODS uh, with a couple minor changes. Uh, the most notable one being the fact that it's uh, it's got that notch filter uh, after the fourth stage on the overdrive channel. 
Um, and then it's got uh, the, you know the, the reverb and effects loop and all that. So we've got four sub-assembly boards. We've got the input board with the FET boost stage. We've got the power supply for, uh, for the filaments and all the other 12-volt uh, stuff. We've got the relay board, and then we've got one that's going to have the reverb and effects loop both on the same board. Everything else is going to be installed on the main circuit board, the uh, this eyelet style PCB that I've designed, or you know soldered on soldered onto sockets or front panel or whatever. Let's take another look at the schematic. I want to show you what I'm, how I'm handling the switching because it's a little bit different than what you would see in other Dumble style builds. What I've done here is I've got a 2N5088, and it could be any NPN transistor, uh, but that's handling the actual switching. That's uh, either on or off, depending on what voltage it's being uh, fed uh, at the base. Uh, but I didn't want to have to uh, run a, a 6 volt or 12 volt signal through a switch or through the foot switch in order to connect it to the base of that transistor to turn it on and off. So instead, what I've got is a second transistor, a PNP transistor, in this case, a 2N5087. They don't have to be a complementary pair. Any PNP transistor will work for this. And the benefit of the PNP transistor is that you can turn it on and off by connecting its base to ground. So this way, I can connect the base of that PNP transistor, the 2N5087, anywhere. I can connect the base of that transistor to a doorknob if I want to, and it's never going to cause any problems with ground loop hum. So this is a much uh, much cleaner way of doing it, and it just helps us avoid any potential problems with ground loop hum. Normally I would uh, build all of the sub-assembly boards and get those out of the way before starting on the core circuit, but in this case I want to know how these boards are going to perform. So I'm going to start with that. Well, I guess this is when I get to find out how much I really like working with these boards, because I just realized I put these uh, power supply dropping resistors all in the wrong spot. Oh, there you go. I was able to res remove all those resistors without disturbing these caps at all. Let's try this again. Now the schematic calls for um, the first dropping resistor, uh, it calls for a 
2.2K, and then a 22K, and then another 2.2K. I don't have any 2.2K in 2 watt or even in 1 watt. So I'm going to use two of these... Um, uh, I'm going to use 1.5K resistors instead of the 2.2K. I think it'll be close enough. It shouldn't really change anything a whole lot. Well, I had to stop. Um, I'm going to hopefully finish this up today, but uh, I had to take a break from this for a couple days because I realized I forgot to order the cathode bypass capacitors for the, the preamp uh, tubes. So um, I think that's going to end up putting me over that $75 mark, unfortunately, because, um, you know, you, you buy a 25 cent part and the shipping's seven or eight bucks anyway. So anyway... I'm going to get on with this. And so far, I'm really liking this circuit board. Um, definitely easier to work with. By the way, if you don't already have one of these, I highly recommend picking up a hemostat. These things make uh, wiring a lot easier because you're able to clamp onto the wire and then it gives you a lot more control when you're, you know, pulling things through or whatever. I use these things all the time. Okay, this next section I'm going to be working on is that uh, notch filter that's going to be sw switched in on the uh, the rock blues switch. When I switch it into the rock setting, it'll uh, carve out a little bit in the mid-range. And since this is all going to be coming off of uh, another capacitor, I can use a low-voltage cap here. Okay, this trim pot here that's going to sit in here, um, these have really tiny leads. I mean, these are not meant to be used in this type of construction, so I've had to uh, add some longer leads to these. So I'll just have to be really careful when I solder this, so I, I don't want these coming undone. Okay. 
Okay, I've got multiple components that have to be soldered into this spot at once, including this trim pot here, which uh, is not going to stay in place very easily. Um, so I can't flip the circuit board over, or it'll all fall out. So... I have to do this upside down, I guess. Yeah, I really should have ordered a different type of trim pot. Okay, so those are both in there and they're pretty, they're both pretty secure. Alright, time to install a ground wire here. Now I'm going to take this opportunity to ground this, to connect this ground plane to ground. So I'm just going to bend one of these leads over and feed it through this hole right here. Okay, I'm sitting here doing some editing on this video and I realized that uh, I put a little bit of misinformation out there before, so I cut that section out and I wanted to re-record what I was saying because, you know, it's inevitable, it's going to happen from time to time, but I'd rather not have any, inf any misinformation in my videos if I can help it. So, a lot of you who, especially those of you who have watched a lot of Dumble Builds or have, have studied Dumble Builds online before, um, you've probably noticed a lot of people use those uh, smooth light brown plate resistors and you probably saw that I was using the uh, the blue metal film plate resistors and you may be wondering why I'm not using those smooth light brown plate resistors like you see in all the other Dumble, bi vi uh, Dumble builds. Those are a Dale Vichy metal film resistor. They're a very, very tight tolerance, 0.5% uh, tolerance in fact. And there, you can get, there are a couple different versions that you can get, and you can get them uh, rated for up to 500 volts. So they cost two or three times as much as the plate resistors that I'm using. The ones I'm using are a 5% tolerance. Um, so it seems to me that there are three different reasons why people will use those Dale Vichy uh, resistors. And the first is the higher tolerance. If you're trying to build an exact replica of a certain amplifier, you really want, uh, you know, you want everything to be as accurate as possible, and I understand that. That's totally reasonable. However, my 5% resistors both measured 99K, which is 1%. And even if they had measured 5% off, let's say they both measured 105K. The difference between a 100K plate resistor and a 105K plate resistor is almost nothing. You're not going to notice any additional gain. It's not going to change the bias point. You'd have to go up to, you know, maybe if, if you had something like a 120K plate resistor, then yeah, you're starting to notice more gain and it's going to affect the bias point a little bit. Um, but, you know, that 
that level of accuracy, the 0.5% tolerance, we're not making measurement equipment. This doesn't have to be super, super accurate. And in fact, the values are going to drift over the years anyway. So um, that's it's not really necessary for that purpose. The second reason I think a lot of people use them is that they look at the data sheet for the ones that I'm using, and I think they're only rated for 200 volts. So they say to themselves, well, my power supply has more than 200 volts in it, so I really need to upgrade to these better resistors. This demonstrates a lack of understanding how these things work because it's not the voltage applied at either end of the resistor that matters. It's the voltage being dropped across the resistor. And in most preamps, uh, you're only dropping about 100 volts. In fact, most of the time it's a little bit less than 100 volts. The third reason I think a lot of people use them is that they see a lot of other people using them and they figure, well, that must be the good stuff, so I want to build my amp using those. Well, it is the good stuff, but in this case you don't really need the good stuff. Don't waste your money. It's not necessary. You're not going to be benefiting yourself at all. You're just spending extra money. Get yourself a regular half-watt metal film resistor. It's good enough. Now that brings me to another thing that, uh, I, that, that comes up a lot, and that is carbon comp resistors. Now, there, it's, there's a lot of debate about carbon comp resistors out there, and yes, carbon comp resistors do lend their own second-order harmonics as, it, as a form of distortion when the resistors are pushed, uh, kind of, you know, pushed to their operational limits. That's when they start to distort. However, the, uh, the parameters required to make uh, that resistor distort are not present in most places in a guitar amplifier. They have to have high voltage, say 100 volts or more, uh, which, you know, you're going to get that on, a, on the plates, but they also have to have a very high output signal swing. And you're not going to get a high enough output signal swing on the first couple gain stages. Uh, in fact, in, uh, on the GeoFX website, uh, he mentions that the best place for, uh, to use carbon comp plate resistors is the stage just before the phase inverter. And anywhere else you use carbon comp resistors, especially if, you're, you know, if it's something like a, a you know, grid resistor, um, you're just adding thermal noise. You're not getting any of the, any of the tonal benefits, it's just getting noisier. So, I tend to avoid carbon comp resistors in most cases, but in this amplifier build, I decided to put some carbon comp resistors on the phase inverter. It may or may not add a little bit of uh, second order harmonics, and if it doesn't, there's really no risk because it's so far downstream that the amount of thermal noise it does generate is it's not going to be amplified a whole lot because the only thing after that is, uh, is the power tubes. And, and by the way, it, this, it makes it even more ridiculous when I see people using carbon comp resistors in their overdrive pedals. People, you gotta stop doing that. Seriously. Okay, back to the build. Okay, so now we're getting into the phase inverter. Uh, first of all, it turns out that I don't have a carbon comp resistor that I can use for the tail resistor, so I'll just use a, a 22K metal film. Uh, the Dumble schematic actually calls for a 27K resistor. 22K is close enough. It may not have quite as linear, linear a response uh, with that slightly lower resistance, but it's not going to be... It's probably nobody would notice the difference. So 22K will be good enough there. Um, also, uh, most double schematics have a uh, 47, uh, 4.7K negative feedback resistor coming off of a 4 ohm output transformer tap, and then they use a, um, a 2K uh, presence pot with um, a 390 ohm resistor in parallel with that for a total resistance of 326 ohms. So, I, this, uh, the output transformer I'm working with only has a 16 ohm output. 
So I'm going to have to use it, and, I, and I'm using a 5K uh, presence pot. Uh, so since I'm using a 5K pot and I'm coming off of a 16 ohm tap, I'm going to use a... Uh, well, the ideal value would be an 18K resistor with that 5K pot. I don't have an 18K resistor, so again, we're going to substitute a 22K resistor for that. Now one of the ways uh, some people like to just kind of squeeze every last ounce of tone out of their amp builds is to use matched capacitors off of the phase inverter plates. And uh, it basically what it does is it just uh, it helps the two halves of, of the phase inverter output to be a little bit more balanced. Uh, that's why Dumble uses the, uh, the balancing pot on his phase inverter output a lot of times. Um, these two uh, happen to measure within uh, one-tenth of one percent of each other, so those are uh, nicely matched. I'm not going to be using a balancing pot because I have actually in, in the past I've, I've done an experiment just to see how well balanced the two sides of uh, phase inverter output were, and with 100k plate resistors on both sides and a fairly high tail resistor, in this case a 22k, you actually get a really balanced output, so the, the extra trim pot's not necessary. Okay, I just realized that I put this uh, bias supply capacitor in backwards, which is really disappointing because I only have one of these, and uh, I'm not sure if the leads are going to be long enough to put it in the other way, so... Uh, hopefully I can fix this. Well, it's actually not a problem, after all. Uh, this pad wasn't being used for anything, and what I had done is, uh, on the top of this uh, capacitor, I bent the lead over to tie it in directly with this, so I'll just uh, put a little piece in here and, and uh, bridge these two pads instead. And really, that works out better, because now when the... Uh, uh, when I wire up the bias pot, I'm going to have one, two, three right next to each other going off to the to the bias pot. So it's probably best that I did it this way. Okay, for bringing the power over from these uh, power supply capacitors to the plate resistors, I'm going to switch to a different kind of wire. This is 22 gauge wire, which is uh, it's plenty heavy for this kind of stuff. Again, these uh, 12 x 7 plates are only drawn you know, maybe five milliamps, but usually not even that much. Um, so this will handle plenty of current. Uh, more importantly, this is 600 volt wire. And the difference between this and the other wire that I normally use is just the thickness of the insulation. When you have high voltages going through a wire, and you've got, <clears throat> let's say we've got these three wires bundled together, if, this, if there's a thin insulation on here, and they're only rated for 300 volts, which is what most of this other wire I use is rated for, then you've, you don't have enough space between the conductors, and you can uh, end up having problems with them overheating. Um, so we'll use this wire, and uh, we'll be in good shape.
Okay, before I tie in these wires to the plate resistors, I'm going to drill some holes in this circuit board for standoffs, and you'll see in a minute why I'm doing this. Well, the recording ended abruptly because my memory card was full. Apparently there were a few uh, videos, older videos on there that I had forgotten to delete. So, uh, fortunately I was almost done with this anyway, so I just went ahead and finished up the last couple of things. Uh, just added a couple more uh, ground wires and uh, finished tying up these wires here. But just wanted to make sure that uh, you got a good shot of what we got done in this video. And here's a, this is what I was doing with those standoffs. Come on, camera, focus. Hello. There we go. This is what I was doing with the standoffs. Just holds these power wires up off the board a little bit and uh, keeps them nicely organized. It's really not necessary. I like the way it looks, and I like uh, just having these wires, you know, nicely organized and and I know that they're not going to get too close to anything but you know if you're just if you're paying good attention to lead dress that's good enough anyway uh made some really good progress uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to finish this one um in, in this video I, I figured I might have to split it into two but uh, I got a lot done so the next thing I'm going to work on is the input board that's got the FET boost stage that'll be in the next video that is it for this week's video. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, click on subscribe and uh, we'll see you in the next video.